so I'm going to kick it off. First of all, what is a health visitor? Who are these elusive professionals? Well, as Suzanne said, we're all qualified nurses or midwives or both by background. And we've actually then done additional master's training at university and within an organisation to qualify as a health visitor. Um, now, what to expect really from your health visitor? So everybody, once they reach their third trimester of pregnancy, um, you'll be notified through Child Health, whichever area you live in, to your health visiting service team. And we basically, uh, we cover those pregnant people from the first, third trimester all the way through up until their child starts school. And we carry the records um, for those individuals, those families and those children up until that point. And then once the child hits school age, we then transfer over to the local authority school nursing team. Now, as part of our service, um, we sort of make contact through that journey with families at different periods. And it can sort of be quite intense to begin with. And then you may not hear from us uh, that often as your child gets older. Um, a lot of the time, what we are doing is collecting information and we're working alongside you, really, alongside with you. Um, I think sometimes people may think that as health visitors, we're here to tell you how to parent. We're not here to tell you how to parent at all we're actually here just uh, to support and advise and inform you and signpost you really and how to achieve the best for yourselves your family and your child and as part of that um, don't be alarmed that we do ask a lot of um, difficult questions sometimes and questions that can feel quite personal at times as well um, and that's all part of the service that we deliver now some of these sort of more difficult questions that we may ask you may be about your mental health which I know is some sessions some fantastic sessions being covered on mental health coming up over this two-day event also we ask you questions about um, your relationships your adult relationships your intimate relationships um, you know baby's parents who are they what that relationship is like and as part of that we will we'll then delve into asking questions about uh, domestic abuse if you've ever had if you've ever been a victim or perpetrator of previous abuse so as I say a lot of the questions that we ask do sometimes feel quite intrusive and quite personal but the reason that we're asking this is because that we are here as I say to support and guide you through this through this journey that I think none of us really feel prepared for you know Suzanne said I'm a mum to three and it has to be said that each journey with each of my three children has been completely completely different my youngest he's actually just turned one so I've had my own little lockdown baby and so I really kind of empathize empathise with the struggles that are going on at the moment, particularly in regard to maternity services and services out there for um, families and children are really, really tricky to navigate your way through at the moment. So the core contacts that you will receive from your health visiting service do differ dependent on if you are in England, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland. Now, I am based in the Midlands. I don't know if you can tell from my accent. And in England, we actually offer five core contacts to families. And these are an antenatal contact in the third trimester, a new birth visit, which is when baby is between day 10 and day 14. Of, of age, um, a six to eight week contact, and then a 10 month to 12 month review and then a two to two and a half year review. Now that's what we call our universal service offer. So they are the five core contacts that we offer. And if all is going well, and as a family, as a parent, you don't feel that you require any additional support, there are no other agencies that are involved, then they are the five contacts that you will have with your health visiting service. And they're the five times that you will hear from us as a service. Now, of course, we know that there are gonna be so many families out there as a, through whatever stage they are in that so that five year journey, five year or so journey that may require additional support, additional services along the road. So even though there are five core contacts, we do sort of change that um, dependent on the families that we are working with. Some families we may work really intensely with in those sort of early few weeks. Maybe, for example, if a parent is struggling with their mental health, of course, then we will be involved with that family, supporting that family through that journey. Or a bit further down the road, if your child potentially has any developmental issues when they maybe reach two and a half, we then are a lot more involved in that family at that stage. So it's very much is a service catered um, for families and children on an individual basis and it's what we like to call holistic so we're looking at the whole picture so we're not just focused on what's going on with the child physically or develop 
developmentally. We're also looking at what's going on um, as a family, so siblings, parents, and the extended family as well. So what's going on there? And then we're looking at as well, what's going on within your community, within your demographic. We know in the UK, we are so wonderfully diverse in this country, but things are very, very different and services that are offered are very, very different in different communities. So we're really, we're very much, um, we're sort of very pliable and we're there for you to use as, as you need us. So as I say, I'm going to kind of briefly cover some of the early week issues um, that we come across as health visitors and that we that we will support you with. Um, our sort of our most intensive involvement with most families is in these early weeks. It's when we um, see you the most. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. Now I've pinched here my, my son's uh, red book. You will be issued this red book. It's called your um, personal child health record or your red book as most of us know it um, as soon as your baby is delivered um, whether that's at home in hospital or on some kind of uh, midwifery led unit and this book has a wealth of knowledge in it and most of the stuff that we actually talk to you about as health visitors is, is kind of covered in this book um, and that's why I've not really put on too many links and things because I always think it's, it's, you know, you feel so bombarded as a new parent that actually too much information can be a bit like, rah, like bombs going off in your face. So a lot of the information you will find in this red book. So, you know, when it's three in the morning and you are desperately trying to get your baby to sleep, have a little look at this red book. It's just the thing that you want to be reading at that time. But I promise you, there's loads of information in there. So I'm going to kick it off a bit about baby sleep. Now, I know there is um, a, sort of a sleeping consultant coming up, so I'm not going to... Um, labour too much on this point but it's one of the questions that we get asked about so much as health visitors when we first get involved with families so I just want to say first of all babies when they're born they don't have a body clock so your baby will not know whether it's night or day and it's you know it's unlikely that your very new baby is going to sleep for longer than two to three hour period that's all because that they need calories they're growing so much physically and inside physiologically all their systems and neurologically so their brain is doing so much growing and so much work it needs the calories and so actually a baby isn't designed to sleep for longer than that period because it will need feeding um, now, the first sort of three to four months, we tend to call the fourth trimester of having a baby. Um, now, this is because that your baby at this age is fully, fully dependent on their parent or their caregiver. So basically, they can't do anything for themselves at this stage. And within this period, a lot, lots of parents will say things like, you know what, my baby just won't sleep in their own bed. As much as I try, they just unsettle. They will only settle if I'm holding them. They will cry lots. All these sorts of questions are the really common questions that we get asked about in these early weeks. Now, it's really, really normal in this fourth trimester stage for your baby to be most comfortable and most settled when they are on you or when they are feeding or when they're being held and that's really really normal. Now every baby is different and some babies settle in their beds better than others or some babies it does take a number of weeks until we actually sort of have those conversations with the parents or caregivers and they actually say you know what success my baby slept in their own Moses basket or in their own cot last night for th a three hour stretch you know it feels fantastic and they are normal conversations I think sometimes we have really high expectations of our babies when they are first born but I just want to reiterate um, that it's completely normal that at this early stage that your baby will just want to be with you and won't necessarily be too happy if you put them in their bed. If you imagine they have been inside your tummy or your partner's tummy or another family member's tummy for nine months, they've been there constantly, they've been able to hear that adult's voice, hear their heartbeat, um, you know, all those sorts of things, had that constant feeding through the placenta and all of a sudden baby is born and we have this expectation that they should be sleeping in their own bed on their own, which can feel absolutely massive to a baby. You know, it's quite a big expectation that we have of babies. So please don't be surprised or concerned if you are in that position. Now, another thing that we really like to talk about in the early few weeks about your new baby is about safe sleep and making sure your baby is as safe as they possibly can be. Now, we are very fortunate um, in Western society that uh, 
cop death rates and sudden infant death syndrome rates are relatively low in comparison to worldwide rates, which is fantastic. But of course, we want to minimise any risk to babies as much as we can. So there are a few key things that we always talk about. Now, these key things that we follow are exactly the things that are stated on the Lullaby Trust, which is um, a website. If you just Google Lullaby Trust, you will find all the safe sleep guidelines. And also in your baby's red book, it's going to be reiterated in there. But some of the key messages that I just want to hammer home to you are that, first of all, your baby should always be sleeping on their back on a flat and firm mattress. Your baby should have their feet to the end of their bed, whether their bed is a Moses basket, whether their baby bed is a cot or a crib. Um, we don't advise the use of any sleeping pods or any nests. Now, I know this is a bit of a contentious issue because some very nice department stores sell these very beautifully uh, looking sleeping pods that a lot of celebrities on social media like to post pictures of their babies in. But they're not. Thank you, Lindsay. That's great. For that post. Um, but they're not actually advised and recommended in regard to safe sleep guidance. So as wonderful as they look, they're not actually um, advised if it's when we're talking about safe sleeping. Um, we also don't advise that your child under the age, your baby under the age of one, sleeps with any pillows in their cot. Um, and you should never, the one place you should never sleep with your baby if you're going to drop off is on the sofa or in an armchair, because we know that there have been accidents with babies where they've got stuck in sofas or they've rolled off. Now, another thing I'll just briefly talk about when it comes to safe sleeping are any of um, parents out there or parents who are wishing to co-sleep or bed share. You might hear it come across. Now, it's absolutely fine to do that, but it's essential that you follow those safe sleep guidance. So, again, you can check out the Lullaby Trust on there on those safe sleeping. Most important thing to remember is you should never um, co-sleep or bed share with your baby if you smoke, if you have taken any alcohol or taken any drugs that may impact you in any way, your reactions. You should make sure that your baby, again, is away from pillows and um, thick quilts and is away from the edge as well. So other things I'm gonna quickly talk about because I'm very well aware of time is a little bit about baby skin. Again, another thing that lots of people ask me about. Babies are born with a natural moisturizer on their skin. So we don't advise sort of within the first couple of days you fully bathe your baby, just a little top to toe is absolutely sufficient. In the early couple of months, do not use any bubble bath or any beautifully smelling lotions or potions on your baby. It may make your baby smell absolutely delicious, but it's not gonna do their skin any good. Um, now, rashes on babies. Rashes on babies are really, really common. A really common one that we see lots is baby acne rash, which is a self-limiting rash, which basically means it will clear up by itself and it can appear any time between birth and your baby being about three to four months old. Just leave the rash. We do, they don't actually advise you put anything on the rash. You can't do anything to improve it. You could try a little bit of Vaseline if it's getting irritated by moisture, but just leave it alone. The most important thing I'll always say with rashes is always do the quick glass test. Just checking that your, your baby's rash is blanching. So it basically means when you're pressing on it, the rash is disappearing and then slowly reappearing. Any rash that doesn't disappear when you're pressing it, either with your finger gently or with a glass, they're the ones that we always advise you get checked out by a medical professional within a couple of hours. And always with any rash, I always say to parents, what else is going on? Is your baby well? Are they feeding? Are they weeing? Are they cooing? Are they alert? Are they developing? all those sorts of questions. Now, infant feeding, again, is another area that we support parents with. Again, I'm not gonna go over that too much because I know there's some sessions covered in this event, but however you wish to feed your baby or you are feeding your baby, whether it's breast, formula or combination feed, we are here to support you. We have done um, training, additional training in lots of these different ways of feeding. So please, please, if you need that support, contact us. So postnatal wellness is another thing that we cover. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we ask a lot of questions about mental health. This is because we know it is so, so difficult um, when you have a baby, you have a massive crash of hormones and you mix in a bit of sleep deprivation. It's a wonderful co cocktail for feeling not that great. And it can affect your mood, your sleep, your appetite, your ability to rest, relapse. If you're breastfeeding, it affects your breast milk supply and also can affect lots of other things going on inside you. So like your, your cardiac system, your gut and all those sorts of things. So please, please, Please reach out if you are concerned, if you are feeling a little bit low, if you're worried, we are here to support you. 
Periods is another big one. Again, I get asked a lot about every person is different. It's quite uncommon for your period to return within the first six weeks. And if you are breastfeeding, particularly if you're exclusively breastfeeding, you may find your period doesn't return between six to 12 months after having a baby. Um, you may also find after having a baby, your periods are a little bit different. But if you are concerned, if you're suffering with severe cramps, pains, if you're passing any large clots, make sure you get that checked out by a GP. Breasts is another thing, regardless of how you're feeding your baby, a good supportive bra. I really advise for all new parents in those early weeks. It's always going to help. And again, any new lumps, bumps, talk to us, talk to your GP, talk to your midwife, and we can support you. Sex, wow. Sex after having a baby is probably the last thing on your mind. And having a baby is probably the best form of contraception going. Um, but it's perfectly okay whenever it's safe and consent consensual to have sex. There is no time frame to wait. Of course, dependent on your type of delivery, if you um, suffered with any tears or lacerations at birth, that's all a consideration, but it's whenever you feel comfortable. And also, I always say, think about other ways you can be intimate with your partner. If you're not comfortable with penetration, that's absolutely fine. Immunizations is another big thing that we as health visitors talk about. I won't go over them too much because, again, they're in this massive, wonderful red book. Immunizations for babies are offered at 8, 12, 16 weeks. They are your baby's new baby vaccinations. And then they will be offered again between the age of 12 to 13 months and then offered again at the age of three and a half to, to four years. In the UK, vaccinations aren't compulsory. They are done after 20% and they mostly are performed in GP practices by a practice nurse. We are here to provide you with lots of information. Of course, we really, really encourage vaccinations because these vaccinations will protect your baby and your family against some really, really nasty, deadly diseases. And finally, development is another one that we will follow your baby through to being a child with. Now, whether that's at their six week review and we're asking you lots of questions, is your baby smiling yet? Are they looking around to their 10 month review? Are they crawling? Are they sitting up? Are they babbling? And then to their two to two and a half year review, are they chatting? Are they able to do lots of little intricate things with their fingers? Are they able to respond appropriately? This is all questions that we're asking because we're following your child's development journey because we're wanting to make sure that everything is running all okay. Now, as I say, every child is different and every child child develops at different stages within their development and that is absolutely fine. We do have things, tools that we use to ensure that your child is reaching what we call their age appropriate milestones but again they are adjusted on your on your own circumstances but if there are any issues we are here to refer you maybe to a GP, to a specialist paediatrician or any other specialist services or we can just signpost you to some local initiatives. <laughs>